Yeah. Hi, Dr. William Starziak here again. And this lecture is on facilitated positional release and still technique. Um, I first made this lecture when I was at Marion University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, I haven't worked there for about a year now, just to be accurate. Um, but thank you again for uh, joining this lecture. In this, um, we have, in, I think in anything we do, it's good to have this overarching intention that may everything we learn easily or with effort go to relieving the suffering of any and all living beings that we can. Uh, because that's why we're all in medicine is to help people. So that's why we're here today is to learn something that hopefully we'll, we will be able to use to be of service. Um, so in this lecture, we want to understand the principles and application of facilitated positional release. I'll go ahead and refer to that as FPR uh, and still technique. We want to understand their technical differences while appreciating their extensive similarities. And uh, we'll also understand this idea of the decreased gamma gain theory that underpins uh, these approaches. Um, this is just a picture from my espresso slash latte slash cappuccino maker. I was really stoked when I got it. So back when I made this lecture, I put this in there. Um, so I have the legend here, just like I did in uh, the other lecture, uh, where anything in green is going to be coming from foundations. Uh, anything in teal, this is my uh, own uh, opinion, thoughts, deductions. And then in orange, this is an osteopathic approach to diagnosis and treatment. Uh, so I cited both of these in the uh, previous lecture as well. Okay, so here's a picture of Stanley Shiowitz when he was a young man. Uh, he is the DO that first described facilitated positional release, and that was back in 1990. And it was considered a modification of indirect myofascial release. Uh, so in addition to the principles of indirect myofascial release, uh, which are the operators placing the structure into a neutral, or a position of ease, uh, the operator also applies a compressive and or torsional force. Uh, this technique is considered passive and indirect, um, and it's considered as related to MFR. Now, most of us will be uh, familiar with these terms about neutral or position of ease, um, a compressional force or a torsional force that also uh, we should understand that and then uh, the passive and indirect technique. I'll, I will uh, define these here. Um, let me just scroll through and see if I should do that now. Yeah, let's go ahead and define those now. So a, a neutral is with respect to range of motion. So if you consider a joint's range of motion when it's not injured, let's say this is its full range of motion, and you have, um, these are the physiologic barriers. So in normal physical activity, a joint could move that much. And then if you could push it a little bit further passively, where if the operator, the physician moves so it lets the patient move up to the end of motion and the patient relaxes and the physician can then move it a few more degrees, you know, maybe up to like five degrees until you hit the anatomic barrier. So the anatomic barrier is that barrier where if you tried to move past it, you would create an anatomic change. Rupture of ligaments, fracture of bones, tearing of muscle, that sort of thing. So now between those two extremes of the physiologic barriers in the middle, there's a resting neutral point. So this is where if there's no muscle contraction, and imagine you know this, this, the body's floating in empty space and the person is totally relaxed. Well then where their body would move to, that would be where their neutral position is. 
uh, the position of ease, meaning that it takes the least amount of effort for the body to stay in that position. Um, and a passive technique is one in which the patient doesn't exert any effort. So in muscle energy, where we have the patient contracting muscles, that's an active technique. But in this one, the patient really needs to stay completely relaxed. So if um, most of us who do this sort of work will be familiar with patients who cannot let go of their arms. If they're laying down and you pick their arm up to begin moving it around, they will immediately engage the muscles and they will block kind of any sort of free motion. Well, with somebody like that, this technique becomes really undoable because the, the holding of a tense muscle won't allow you to perform this with, you know, with the patient being passive. The patient can't be passive. So you need to help the patient learn how to relax and let go before this approach will be useful. Sometimes it's a matter of sequencing. They're tensing up because it's, it's the wrong order of things. And if you go the correct way, then they will relax when you get to that region. But sometimes people just have a lot of shock trauma in their system where they're just, they're keyed up and they just subconsciously will hold and uh, won't allow themselves to relax. So with that, it, it can take some retraining over time. Um, but just learning, for them, just learning how to relax and let go, that will be treatment in and of itself. That's like the first step of treatment and it will have benefit um, for how they feel and how they function. Uh, now then an indirect technique, we really need to understand the idea of a restrictive barrier in order to understand an indirect technique. So if we think about this being normal range of joint motion, so you know, like this to this, well, say there's an injury or even better let's just use my head let's say you know normal range of motion is like this and then i suffer an injury where um I, i'm driving my car and i get hit from the side and so my head whips that way really hard and then it kind of rebounds back this way but the force that whips it that way is really strong so then likely with a person that has that sort of injury their neutral will shift so if they're laying on your table or even if they're sitting up and you contact the structure and you feel where they want to move, it's going to be easier for them to move this way than it will be for them to move that way. So now their new neutral position or position of ease will be off to that side. It generally tends to move towards the um, position of maximal force delivery. So during the injury, whenever the maximal force was being delivered into the person's structure, that's where the body tends to shift towards into its new neutral. So now instead of having physiologic barrier, physiologic barrier, you may find physiologic barrier, physiologic barrier. So they're not going as far that way. They stop earlier. And the neutral is, is right here. So now there's a restrictive barrier, not a physiologic barrier, over here. So direct and indirect is all with respect to a restrictive barrier. An indirect technique, you'll end up moving away from the restrictive barrier to find neutral and ease, and the treatment begins in neutral or ease. Or even it sometimes begins in an exaggeration away from the barrier, so slightly past neutral. A direct technique the operator's force will actually be moving towards the restrictive barrier. So that's like muscle energy technique, direct myofascial release, high velocity, all of those are direct. Um, but whenever we're moving away from the restrictive barrier to find ease, that is indirect. So FPR is passive and indirect. And we'll, I'll review those concepts again. Facilitated positional release is directed at normalizing hypertonic musculature. Really any musculature can be superficial or deep. And the theory is that it works by action of the muscle spindle gamma loop. Um, and it's from creating a sudden decrease in gain um, or neural activity. So the decrease in the gamma neuron, that is, uh, efferent 
So the decrease in gamma neuron efferent activation, um, which uh, occurs from shortening the muscle. So the sudden decrease in loading of a muscle stops the A1 afferent nerve uh, firing from the spindles, which in turn prevents the activation of the motor neurons to the extrafusal muscles or the alpha motor neuron, which is efferent. So basically what this is saying is when we shorten the muscle and we unload the spindle, so the spindles are no longer registering hypertonicity. Now they're registering that the muscle is relaxed. This decreases the signal that's being sent back to the central nervous system via these 1A uh, nerves that are coming from the spindles. And then when, when that signal decreases, it in turn will decrease the efferent or the, the nerve signal, the motor neuron that's coming from the central nervous system back to the muscle. And then the muscle can relax. So by the spindles having decreased tension on them, the nerve sensing the spindle tension, decrease the amount of, of and for, they decrease their firing going back to the, the central nervous system, which in turn will decrease the amount of signal being sent from the gamma neuron um, and relaxing the, uh, the muscle cell. So that alpha, mo alpha, alpha motor neuron relaxing the motor cell. So gamma is controlling the muscle spindles the alpha is shortening the muscles, and they're activated together in normal muscle function. So the, the unloading of the muscle that decreases that 1A nerve afferent firing will prevent the activation of the motor neurons, the alpha motor neurons, to the extrafusal muscle fibers, as well as the gamma neurons. So both of those together. So then the muscle spindles and the muscles themselves will relax. That's the theory, and this is supported by research. If you go to um, the source here, which is the osteopathic approach to diagnosis and treatment, you can find the citations if you want to dig deeper into this research to understand it better. Um, I am, am clinically minded, so there's, you know, the research is really cool and it's good to know, but uh, if we can't feel it and we don't experiencing it, experience it happening, then we can know all the research in the world, but it won't, it won't mean anything to our patients. Um, so for me, this is, this is really secondary, um, but if you want to dig further, you know, the citation is there. All right, so the first step of any treatment is diagnosis. That is clear uh, from the beginning in osteopathy. We're not just gonna do the same thing to everybody, um, hoping that they have the problem that we're trying to treat. We actually wanna be intelligent and diagnose what we're going to treat. So since FPR is geared towards hypertonic musculature, uh, we need to look for tenderness. Hypertonic muscu musculature will be tender. And it will also have a feeling of increased density and resistance to pressure and motion. And it will be associated with visible asymmetry. So whatever screening method you use, uh, you should be looking, if you're going to use FPR, you should find these things. So this tissue texture change associated with hypertonicity, tenderness, and visible asymmetry. You'll have at least two of these. Um, and since hypertonic deep small spinal musculature maintains segmental dysfunction, you can also treat uh, a segmental diagnosis using FPR. And the treatment position will be the same as the segmental diagnosis. So if you find an extended right right dysfunction, well, you're going to find the beginning uh, for the treatment in that position an extension, rotation right, and side bend right. So there are some contraindications um, and precautions here. 
So if the patient is not able to tolerate the positioning or experiences discomfort, either alternate positioning of the region or an alternative technique should be used. So you know, if, if they're getting pain, you're not just gonna push through that. Um, they really need to be able to relax for this to work. Um, so if they're guarding and holding because of pain, use something else or see if there's a way you can reposition it. If they're experiencing radicular pain, uh, these techniques in the cervical spine, you're applying compression and that can cause radicular pain in certain cases. So then you need to reposition and be more subtle with your engagement so you don't cause the radicular symptoms. Um, or you can try using traction instead. Uh, generally, with FPR, traction is not considered an activating force. You'll see later when we go over still technique that it is one of the activating forces in still technique. But in the cervical region, it is discussed as one of the possible activating forces, uh, which is interesting. Um, so lumbar techniques may put torsion on the knees or hips that have de degenerative changes uh, or if there's prosthetics. So you want to be really intelligent about if you're going to employ those in someone with prosthetic hips or knees and then be very sensitive with how you do. Um, and then performing lumbar discogenic treatment would be contraindicated with a patient who's had a hip replacement as the external rotation and torque forces may possibly disarticulate the joint. Um, yeah, that's a big no-no. Um, you definitely don't want to disarticulate someone's hip. All right, so there's a few more here. Uh, the compression and twisting involved in shoulder treatment may exacerbate conditions where there are newer chronic shoulder dislocations or separations. So be sensitive if you're going to attempt this approach in that uh, setting. And then any recent trauma of any region should raise suspicion of a fracture or dislocation. Compression, even the relatively small forces used in FPR, may make a stable fracture unstable. So you really need accurate diagnosis and integration of clinical knowledge should direct the use of any intervention. This is why we are physicians. We've been fully trained so that we know when it's appropriate to do these treatments and when it's not. So don't just do the same thing to everyone. Don't just jump into the pool without knowing how deep it is, so to speak. You know, you, you don't want to dive in head first if it's a four foot pool. So you should know the status of your patient before applying this technique. It's not suitable in fractures um, or uh, dislocations. The, the approach used for relocating joints shares some similarities to FPR, um, but that it's its own specific thing. Uh, caution but not contraindication should be used in the case of osteoporosis, malignancy, rheumatologic disorders, congenital malformation, stenosis, or other clinical diseases. All right. Now, Shirewitz utilizes, this is a direct quote from Foundations, utilizes a very rapid method of diagnosis that incorporates the introduction of small motions to test all cardinal planes of motion. The appreciated palpatory response indicating relative freedom and resistance results in a specific diagnosis. So what this means, you know, in the beginning when we're first learning, a lot of us really tighten up and we want to pin this thing down and look at it so hard and we really end up, you know, putting in a lot of force and like trying to like pay so much attention uh, that sometimes it's hard to actually feel what's going on because we just put too much tension into ourselves. So this approach for diagnosing the motion is really gentle. And it's, it's, it's looking at that beginning of ease, that beginning motion, right? Where wherever the structure is laying, wherever it starts, it's going to be relatively close to its neutral point because the neutral point is, is pulling, the body's pulling into the neutral point. The tension is trying to pull it there. It's like there's gravity to it. So usually you're just, you're just overcoming the, the tissues that are, that are trying to pull it back to the original neutral. You're just gently overcoming those. And so you'll feel right at the beginning with a very subtle amount of, a very light amount of force, 
you'll feel right away, okay, this is easy, this is hard. This is easy, this is hard. So you don't, you don't want to tighten up too much or, tr or put in a lot of force. Um, these are small motions and you just check every, every plane and see, all right, easy, okay, easy, um, to determine the, the relative freedom. So first you make the diagnosis. You find hypertonic musculature that you intend to normalize. And the next step, as Shiawitz describes it, is the region that you're treating uh, needs to be put into a point between flexion and extension. So don't rush with this, just find your time. So find the end of flexion, find the end of extension, and then you can wobble back and forth until you balance it right in between. So you find neutral there. So first flexion extension, find neutral. Um, and if it's the spine, the idea generally is flatten the curve. Now, I would recommend instead of just, just blindly flattening the curve, actually put it into neutral, actually find where neutral is. And then you're going to add a compressive force. And this will look different in different regions of the body. So if you're using like the arm or the leg, you're compressing through, you know, the long axis of the bone. If you're treating the neck, frequently you're compressing through the head. If you're treating the thoracics, you're compressing through the shoulders. If you're treating the lumbar, you frequently have them on the side and then you're compressing through the ischial tuberosity and maybe also through the shoulder as well at the same time. Um, and so in FBR, it is noted that occasionally traction may be needed, but generally compression is indicated. Um, Torsion is also a possibility. So the activation of compression, traction, and or torsion, in my mind, is just another dimension of balancing the force loaded into the structure through trauma. So why sometimes does traction release something better? Why sometimes does, does compression release it? Why sometimes does torsion release it? My theory, and I think a lot of DOs share this, though I haven't heard it, you know, or read it expressed in this exact way, is that if an injury is tractional, traction will help balance the change that was created by that injury. So it will help bring the structure to its neutral, which in that neutral, there may be a good amount of tension because imagine, you know, you're holding on to uh, one of the, the tow ropes for water skiing. And they take a corner really fast and it gets yanked out of your hand. Well, that would be a tractional injury that could create a new balance of tension that would require you to traction the wrist out in order to really balance those ligaments because now they would be a little bit looser. They'd be stretched out in that direction. And then if it moved off to one side, well, they might be stretched and then, and then shifted as well where there's some radial or ulnar deviation depending upon the motion. So I, I, I think that activation force is really just another dimension of the balancing. So in finding neutral, same thing with a torsion. So if something, an, in, an injury is twisted off, well then to really get it to its neutral, we need to twist in that same sort of way, not with as much force as the injury has, but to really move it in that same way so that the ligaments, the way they were strained, we bring them back kind of to approach that, that position of the strain so that they can release the change that was made. It's, it's the, um, the parallels that we find in emotional work and physical work to me are astounding. So if you wanna help someone release an emotional trauma, Frequently, there will be a, a desensitization to it, where a person is re-exposed in a safe environment to some fraction of that emotional trauma. Um, if, it's a, if it was you know, abuse of some sort in a setting with a counselor after a person becomes comfortable and feels safe and secure and can relax, the counselor, therapist, psychiatrist, 
may guide them back into a recollection of that trauma. But bringing with them this notion of that, you know, it's over and everything is okay, but allowing themselves to feel that trauma and to release the charge so that it can be reintegrated. So this part of them that has become stuck, that has become frozen, can, can rejoin the rest of the psyche and, and become more fluid and less restricted. Again. And this is the same thing we do with the structure. The principles that apply to this more subtle aspect of ourselves, the emotions, they also apply to the physical structure. We, we bring the body back to this point of where the trauma took it, but in a safe, comfortable, easy way. And then that part that was locked out from the body that wasn't integrated can now get better flow. Lymphatics, uh, vasculature, neural, and then something there happens with you know the neural loop back to the central nervous system where then in that position, in that neutral, something can release and become more fluid again. Okay, so then while maintaining the activation force, the muscles to be treated are placed in the, into their specific position of ease. So in the spine, this would correlate to the segmental diagnosis. You know, anywhere else, it would just be, okay, well, where, where does that create ease? So if you're monitoring a muscle for its tension, then you're going to find ease by the tension on that muscle reducing. Right? So when you first put your activating force, that's going to reduce muscle tension. But then you, you feel in the structure, you know, where does it want to move to get its maximal ease? And then once you get there, um, you uh, wait for the release. You hold in that position and you wait for the release. And then uh, as it releases, you return it back to neutral. Now, foundations is different than the um, atlas of osteopathic, this is the atlas of an osteopathic approach to diagnosis and treatment. So foundations actually has a four step, fourth step when they describe this. And they say, subsequent positioning into resistance seeks to affect a larger regional muscle groups or smaller intrinsic deep muscles involved in joint mobility. The study was published and written as indirect, but it was actually practiced and taught as a combination of indirect and direct. What you'll find as we go over still technique makes FPR even more similar to still technique. Um, so I want to bring up this thing that uh, I talked with. So I worked with at Marion University at the same time Dr. Kuchera did. Um, and he said, Back when he was training, basically you had direct and indirect, and indirect, it was just indirect with tricks, where you would use different activation forces. So all of the indirect really starts at that ease, at the neutral point, no matter what tissue we're directing it at. So if we're doing balanced ligamentous tension, or indirect myofascial release, or FPR, we're still technically, we're, we're basically focusing uh, either on the ligaments or on the fascia or on the membranes, but they, they're all one, right? That's one of the principles of osteopathy. They're all one. And balance is balance. If we have one balanced, we really have all of them balanced. And then there are these different tricks that can be used to accomplish the release and the returning back towards neutral. So within uh, indirect myofascial release, there's breathing, there's springing, um, but then as you, as you bring in osteopathy in the cranial field, now the cranial rhythm can become a motive force to return something back to neutral. So we can do indirect myofascial release, but using the cranial rhythm as our, as our activating releasing force. Or, but as soon, but now the way we have it divided up, it's like, okay, these are all individual techniques as opposed to they're indirect and then different ways to get the release to happen. But you'll see the, the, the principles are all the same 
It's just this little difference on how are we activating the release. So to me, there are really blurry margins in these techniques. And you see this here where FPR and still technique are really basically the same. Shiowitz, when he published it, he didn't talk about going through the restrictive barrier into resistance. But when he taught it, that's how he taught it. And all of his students attest to that. That's how it's actually practiced. So you, you uh, flexion extension is put into neutral. The activating force of compression, torsion or traction is applied. And then it's further positioned into its ease. And then it's held there until a release is palpated. And initially, Shiowitz wrote, then the compression force, the activating force is released, and it's returned to neutral. But how he would actually practice it and teach it to people was that force was maintained, and then he would take it through neutral. Um, and so with that, really FPR and still, as you'll see, are remarkably the same. Okay, so now we'll talk about still technique which was described uh, six years after FPR by Richard Van Buskirk, D.O. And he pieced this together from historical records of uh, Andrew Taylor Still. The idea was that he wanted to um, look back to how is Still treating at the end of his life? Uh, what did he evolved into with his treatment? Uh, and he published his book in 99. Um, there's an, and it's called, um, uh, I think it's the Atlas of Still Technique. Um, I don't recall the name off the top of my head, but it's by Richard Van Buskirk and Still Technique is in the title. So he used the early writings of Still, uh, Dr. Still student, sorry, uh, Dr. Hazard uh, to help inform this. Um, and obviously this up here in the right hand corner is Dr. Van Buskirk. Um, and Dr. Van Buskirk said FPR lacks the final articulatory component of still technique. But as I said earlier, those who trained with Shiowitz tend to disagree, saying that Shiowitz frequently used a direct force after the initial indirect positioning. Still is a passive technique, first indirect, then direct. Um, so, and then it's also considered as related to MFR. Now, as with most manipulative techniques, it's not advisable to use still technique across recent wounds, surgical or otherwise, same is true of FPR, um, or fractures less than six weeks old. Since it utilizes minimal force, it's safe to use in patients of all ages. And then all the other contraindications, adjustments, and precautions that apply to FPR also apply to still. So this is how uh, it is described in the, the two um, sources I cite. First, patient needs to be passive. If they can't be passive, it's not gonna work. Uh, the joint tissues are moved into the position of ease. Then there is an exaggeration of the dysfunction away from the barrier. So in this case, when we use the neck, if we're just looking at side bending, so you know the, the barrier's here, the neutral's here, so then we, you know, move a little bit further away from the barrier, then apply the traction or compression to create further relaxation of the tissues. And now this isn't geared specifically at muscle. This is really a global perspective of the tissues in general, the fascia, ligaments, muscle, all together, where is it pulling the structure to? And then you maintain the force, the, um, the uh, compressive or tractional force, and you move the joint tissue through the barrier. And then you release the force and allow the structure to return to normal and reassess. Um, so this is, this is how Still would practice. He would, you know, when people would gather around and watch him, he would take something uh, into its indirect position of ease, put in that activation force, and then just for a moment or two wait as he was balancing it and, and, and getting the release, and then as it released, he would keep that, that activation force in and it would move through its range of motion. So to me, my impression of this, using it for treatment, when I find that it really works is when I have already felt the release and the range of motion is not directed by me. The moving it through the restrictive barrier is actually an expression that flows from the release. 
that the, that the soft tissue is released and now it's like a spring that was loaded and is letting go and I'm just facilitating its motion. I'm not actually um, directing the motion. And, and then that's generally when you'll, you'll frequently with this get an articular click. And this makes sense why we hear still talking about don't hunt the pop. Because when he would do this technique, frequently there would be a pop. And it was very tempting for people watching to think that it's all about the pop. Because if you're watching him do this and you don't fully understand what he's doing in the first phase of releasing the tension in the, in the soft tissues, so that there is a, a, a reorganization, reorganization of balance of neutral, then you may think that that first phase is just diagnostic or is you know, someone who is not watching and really trusting still may think it's even just to trick them and that the real treatment comes from getting the pop. Um, but still was very clear that you may or may not get a pop. That's not what we should be going for. What we should be going for is finding the ease and getting the release, and then it, it will move out in the motion that it couldn't do before because the restrictive barrier has resolved itself and the, the, the joint is just ready to move back to that place it couldn't go before. You know, so like um, a good analogy would be like right now, we're all, we can't go to our favorite restaurants because of the pandemic. We have a restrictive barrier of this viral pandemic that's keeping us at home. As soon as that barrier is released, no one's gonna have to force us to go out to our favorite restaurant. You know, when we're ready, we're gonna go out to our favorite restaurant as soon as possible. And we're gonna have a sense of relief at being able to do that. So it's really about resolving the barrier first. This is why if we just do high velocity alone, often we are discouraged and we end up having to do it over and over and over because the soft tissue component isn't ever addressed. Right. Um, so the true application is in the ability to examine, adapt, and individually apply the method. Um, and I just used a little bit of Jamaican patois here that I won't subject you to me attempting to do a bad accent. Uh, but you have to feel it, you know? You have to feel um, the process. If you, you can't think your way through this. Um, I've always thought osteopathy is, is more like a sport than it is like math. Math, the numbers stay still for you on the page. Um, there's no, you know, there's no wiggliness to any of them. Um, they just, it's all set, solid, dry. But in a living being, there are axes shifting upon axes. So you need, you can't, you can't turn it into math. You can't turn this, this beautiful, dazzling living structure into math. It's too complex. But we have this system, this ability to feel it and to interpret that information and present it to ourselves, to our mind in this, this understandable way, where once we feel it, things become intuitive. And this is uh, just a restatement of what I already said. In this color, this is my, you know, these are my personal deductions. So uh, the still technique is used successfully to treat virtually all tissues of the body, including the head, spine, sacrum, pelvis, limbs, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and viscera. Its efficacy is only limited by the practitioner's knowledge of functional anatomy. We, we need to um, like rid ourselves of any idea of needing to achieve a certain degree of motion. So for the sacrum, for instance, the motion that you're going to achieve in, in a release in the sacrum is going to be far less. Uh, the same principles apply though. It needs to be guided into ease and there needs to be a force that um, further, it's like disengages the joint. So whatever creates greater ease in the joint, compression, torsion, traction. Um, 
and then when the release happens, you need to be able to move with it so it can go past through where the restrictive barrier was. So knowledge of functional anatomy is a combination of two things. It's like the two wings of a bird. A bird can't fly if it has one wing. It needs two. So the same thing with this treatment. We can't just know anatomy and we can't just feel. We need to combine our ability to feel with our knowledge of anatomy. Those need to become integrated where both of them feel very fluid. So this is, you know, this is the function of our corpus callosum in our brain. We want to have both halves of our brain communicating freely with each other so that we can have our maximal resources available to help. You. So FPR versus still. Technically, these two are different in that still technique requires an exaggeration of the position of ease, while FPR starts with a true idling position. FPR does not absolutely require moving the joint tissue through the barrier although this is frequently done by FBR practitioners and it was taught by Shiloh's. So as, as Still exhorted us at you know, the very beginning uh, to not merely respect tradition or to respect someone because they're old or they've been around for a long time or because other people respect them. We should investigate the facts and we should become convinced ourselves. We should prove these laws of nature to ourselves and make up our own minds. Uh, because a law is a law is a law. If it's a law, it's a law. And it, you can't get around that being the case. So it makes sense that these are similar because Shiowitz and Van Buskirk and Still, they are all looking for the same thing. They're all working with the same thing. So the principles that we use to release traumas held in the body, well, they're all using the same principle. They're maybe just describing it a little bit differently, relating to it a little bit differently. And that's more about them than it is about the principles that they're using. So that's, that's my, you know, they, they dug into the same gold mine. They just kind of are looking at it from a different angle. So this is, um, you know, again, this is, are my opinions here about prognosis when using FPR still. You know, if it's a structural problem created by trauma, a skilled osteopath can expect a fairly quick resolution of the problem. The length of time and the number of treatments to resolution, that'll depend on the age of the patient, the age of the problem, the patient's general level of health, fitness, vitality, nutrition, um, emotional state, uh, and the intensity of the causative traumas. So if they had a, you know, a 50 pound thing fall on their head versus a five pound thing, then all other things being equal, the person with the five pound trauma is going to get better faster than the 50 pound trauma. On your average patient who has a chronic condition, uh, they should see a significant release of relief of their symptoms after the first treatment on average, but this doesn't happen for everyone. Sometimes it can take a few treatments, uh, but on average, most people will see relief after the first one, and that'll be for a period of time. Usually the symptoms will return after a few days. Um, frequently, they won't return to pretreatment levels within a week. So usually um, people applying this technique will get them back in a week. Um, someone with a lot of experience may um, personalize that a little bit more, where if they know that they really got this thing freed up and the patient needs more time, you know, maybe two weeks up to a month. Um, but generally, you know, in the beginning and even years into practice, a week is very reasonable. Um, and then each additional treatment will result in a longer symptom-free period, and that intensity of symptom will also decrease. So their maximum intensity should decrease. So even if their symptoms begin to return, they won't return as strongly. So for the average sort of person, 
I see, I need an average of four sessions, each one about a week apart. Um, then with maybe an additional four spread out over a month uh, to get a problem to where like it's, it's as wiped out as it can be. Um, and there's some variability, but I'm just speaking about kind of averages across the board because some problems will resolve in one in others where there's an anatomic change where they had to have a fused disc or they, they have an anatomic disruption that happened when they were young you know, really old trauma. Sometimes those patients need ongoing care, but what we'll almost always see, it's, it's only a small minority we don't see this in, what we'll almost always see is that their need for that care decreases over time, so long as they're not re-injured, but that we don't need to see them once a week, every week for the rest of their life. Maybe we need to see them once a week for a while, but then we move out to every two or every four weeks, and then they gradually move out to every two months, every three months, every four months, every six months. And they may even like get to this point where they like, they're doing something else in their life and they're less focused on their pain and they're more focused on what they're doing in their life. And they don't think to come back till like six months or a year. Um, so we just need to take things how they are, take reality how it is and our skills how they are and we can't get someone better by demanding. We have to apply these laws and be diligent, but also be patient. And um, so long as we're seeing improvement, then you know to continue to work with it. If we're not seeing a change, if we're stuck in the same place, doing the same thing, then we need to consider something else. Either we need to take a new approach we need to look somewhere else in the body. We need to use a different uh, treatment or we need to bring someone else in, another uh, practitioner to help us out. All right, so um, we should have some time here for questions. Uh, thank you again very much for uh, taking the time to join us on this uh, teleconference um, and for listening to my lecture. I'll go ahead and answer questions now.